My name is Dr. Carrie Bedient. I'm a practicing reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist in Las Vegas, and this is Med School Insider's Why I Did. I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist. REI is the shorthand for that. What we focus on are all of the hormonal disorders that can occur in mostly men, but some, excuse me, mostly women, but some men too, and how that impacts reproduction, as well as the procedures to help them get to the point of having their family, whether that is inseminations, in vitro fertilization, surgeries, and all of the things surrounded with the organs and the hormones that help make babies. I was first exposed to medicine as a little kid. I had asthma and living in Arizona, my allergies kicked up without fail every fall. And I would always find myself in uh, Dr. Sam, that was the name of my pediatrician, uh, his office doing nebulizer treatments. And so it, it was pretty much without fail every single year for many, many years as a kid. So that's how I started to be introduced to the world of medicine. I knew that I wanted to go into medicine when I had more direct exposures to it. So when I was around 14, I had the opportunity to go into the neurosurgical suite with the dad of, of one of my friends. And so we went in and we were watching somebody get a craniotomy. And I just remember being in there watching the the cage that was around this man's head and then them literally drilling into it and all of this blood spilling out and him being improved by this. I mean, how many places can you put a hole in somebody's head and actually see an improvement in their life? So that was one of the first places that I was exposed. And then the second one that really made much more of an impact is when I had an experience with my dad. I was 16 years old, we were on vacation. My parents were divorced, so I was really next of kin and he had called out saying that he couldn't get up called the ambulance and it turns out that he was having a stroke. Because I was the next of kin and making all these decisions, I called a neurosurgeon that I knew and went through everything that was going on and what needed to happen. And we decided to give TPA, which was at that time experimental in the hospital that we happened to be in out of state. And that experience was the first exposure to getting a lot of information, making a decision quickly, pulling everything together and then seeing what happens. And thankfully it worked out really well. But from then on, I was made to be a doc. During undergrad, I started off with a chemistry major. And then as I got to the end of that, realized I had time to add on another major. And so I added in biology as well. So I doubled. There were a few options that I explored in terms of other careers. I looked at being a PhD in chemistry. Um, I looked at teaching and ultimately always went back to medicine because I wanted to teach and in going into medicine, wanted to be able to take really technical information and translate it into lay terms. And I remember giving that as a reason to the dean who interviewed me on my med school interviews. And that ultimately was what kept drawing me back of, I can do this, I can take this really technical world and translate it into something understandable for a normal person. My experience in undergrad was awesome. I went to Washington University in St. Louis and still have some amazing friends from, from those days. Um, there were definitely doubts as I was going through that time because WashU is a school that produces a ton of physicians and I was with a lot of brilliant, cutthroat and very driven people. I remember being in quantum physics as a freshman, um, my first semester and talking to the professor and agonizing as pre-meds do that I was getting a B minus. And he said, well, maybe you're just not meant to be a physician. And that even more solidified both the, the doubts and the fears that I had, as well as the stubborn streak of, I can do this. I didn't really, take any gap years. I went straight through from high school to college, to med school, to residency, to fellowship. So there was no extra time that I spent in there. Med school was rough, especially the first couple years of it. The didactic years I struggled. I was able to learn the information and pass the tests, but it was harder to see the application to real life. Once I got into the second half of medical school, it was much better because when I did my OBGYN rotation, I found my people and was able to really find my drive and find my purpose and start to do research, make more connections and really enjoy what I was doing. Having all of the friends that I made during that process was really helpful. I met my husband the second day of school and going through that with him by my side was huge and now we've been married for 13 years. When I was in medical school, when I did my OBGYN rotation, I felt at home. And prior to that, I had done general surgery, and I loved the surgery, but I hated the surgeons because they were stiff and they were mean. And at least in my experience, I did not want to join that world. I really enjoyed family practice 
and was able to identify with a lot of the patients. But when I realized later, the patients that I liked seeing the most were all of the GYN patients and the OB patients. I didn't actually like any of the internal medicine part, which is still very firmly implanted in my mind as eternal medicine, not internal medicine. Um, once I got into that, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I had previously considered pediatric ID and peds endocrinology because I love those pathways for ID. I was convinced that I wanted to study Ebola and Marburg and all of the level four infectious diseases. And then once I got into it, I realized that I was bored to tears and really wanted to do something procedural. Residency was very intense. I still remember all of the times that I felt I couldn't do it, being questioned on rounds, having to make a decision in the operating room, whatever it may be. But I also very much remember the times that I realized I could do it. So I had a lot of cheerleaders working with me, both faculty and friends and family. And I remember some of those moments in our boardroom, for example, where we did board sign out every day. And one of our faculty members was leading in this topic of PPROM for OB patients. And I was in August of my intern year and he would sit there and he always had a diet Pepsi and he would tilt it and vent it and ask a question, tilt, vent, ask a question. And he did this so many times, just asking me question after question. And I kept nailing it. And at the end of that question session, all the rest of the faculty kind of gave me a nod. You passed, you did it, you can stay. And I realized, hey, I can do this. Those moments kept me going through residency, but it was intense. Eight weeks of night float at a time where you never saw the time of day, having a full on anxiety attack stuck between a robot when you're in this position for five hours retracting. Those were hard times, losing patients for the first time. Those were very hard and it was very intense but the training was well worth getting. My favorite part of my specialty is being able to call people with positive pregnancy tests and being able to be there at their last pregnancy ultrasounds before they graduate from my clinic and move on to their regular OBGYNs. Um, those, those are the best times. I also really enjoy the times when I can help someone and comfort them and teach them and tell them, all right, this is how we're gonna get through this and you can do this because the patients go through some extremely emotional and occasionally demoralizing times. And to be able to be a cheerleader and help them through that is one of my favorite things to do. One of my least favorite parts of all of this is working with patients who have really inappropriate expectations of what I can accomplish. It doesn't matter how young and beautiful and amazing and accomplished you are. If you are 46 years old, it's really hard to get eggs that are good. And no matter how accomplished I am or any of my colleagues are, there are things that you just can't beat about biology. And so working with people who really are overestimating what I can do um, is very challenging, as well as working with people who really underestimate what we're able to do. But I think that that's one of the most challenging parts of what I do that I don't always like a whole lot. Knowing what I know now, I would have done different majors in undergrad. I should have majored in Spanish and become totally fluent. Right now I'm medically fluent, but if I wanna ask somebody how their kids are doing, I have a really hard time understanding the nuances of the response. And I should have gotten more business education. I should have done a minor, at least in business, because now helping to run my own practice, I need all that information. Learning how to read contracts, thinking about negotiations is important. And I feel like I'm behind the eight ball. Understanding taxes, understanding insurances, all of those things I really wish I had a better grounding in rather than um, business for dummies. Students who fit well in the specialty are people who are meticulous and people who are patient. Much of what we do focuses on can you catch tiny abnormalities? Can you catch the nuances in lab results? Are you very meticulous about getting every last egg that you can, about optimizing everything that you can? The data is continually growing and you have to be on top of what is new, what works, and what is snake oil. You need to be really patient because our patients are some of the most anxious in medicine. They very much want their family. These are hopes and dreams that they have not even known that they've had since they were little kids and they can't do it without your help. And you need to be very patient walking them through the anger, the sadness, 
and the fatigue that comes with fertility treatment. Probably the most helpful advice for medical students pursuing this is start your research early. Um, the match is very competitive coming out of OBGYN into REI. It's maybe 65% or so um, on an average year. Sometimes it's better and worse, but the more research you have, the better. And really get an idea of, can you handle the patient expectations? And can you deal with the psychosocial parts of what we do because the the medicine is fascinating the technology is fascinating it's patient interactions that you really have to know you are well suited for in order to make this a lifelong career managing kids with a full-time job is a full-time job in and of its own i have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old um, the biggest good choice that i made was my choice of partner because he handles a lot of the load in terms of the mental load of making appointments, making sure that doctor visits are gotten to, that pickup times and extracurricular activities are tracked and followed. And so he handles a lot of that with me. It is not just me. We have a fabulous um, nanny and babysitter who help us with a lot of the transportation and she is a another parent for us and letting go of I am the only mom is huge because she is she is a huge factor in their life. We love her, we trust her, and she is family now. Um, throwing money at the problem is huge because if you can pay for good childcare, it's really helpful. And if you can pay for good schools and the help that you need, it really makes being a parent in such a challenging environment um, a much easier proposition. Managing actually having a child in the midst of training and practice was was definitely a challenge. I had my first child when I was in my second year of fellowship and it corresponded with a research year, which was very helpful because I had lab time and was better able to run my own hours. It meant that I was able to better able set it, to set aside time for pumping so that I could go every couple of hours and make sure that my kiddo always had breast milk to eat. When I was a, an attending, it was a little bit harder because I was running a full clinic and so I always made sure to set aside time in my schedule you know 20 minutes here 20 minutes there I bought equipment that was really conducive to doing things quickly and really I decided by that point it didn't matter what the timing was it was always going to be awkward and I was always going to have to miss out on something um, whether that is salary for the time that I was out on leave or taking care of every last little thing but was able to set that aside for long enough to Take the time off to deliver, recover, bond with my kiddo, and then take off time in clinic in order to pump, which was really important to me, and then to get home at a reasonable hour. So even though I did a lot of charting after hours because it meant that I could get home in time to see kiddo before they went to bed, um, that trade-off was worth it. And so being able to be flexible made all the difference in the world in physically having kids and practically managing the things that you need to manage with a newborn or the financial considerations for women in medicine. I think there are three things that people should consider. The first is you need to set up an FU fund. This is a walk away fund. This means that no matter what situation you are in, you can get yourself out of it. That can be a bad relationship, that can be a bad job, that can be a terrible living situation, whatever it may be. You need to have enough money set aside in your name and your name only that you can access that allows you to walk away from something that is not healthy or safe for you. So that's the first thing. The second thing is consider getting a prenup. And this is controversial and it is a very uncomfortable thing for women to talk about because you are going in with a significant amount of earning power into your relationship. Whether your future spouse has a lot or a little earning power, part of it is protecting what you want to preserve and what you have built for yourself because nobody else logged those time those times in medical school, those hours in residency. So you need to be able to protect what you have. And the goal of a prenup is that you never ever need it. But when you do need it, it's after a relationship is deteriorated and you wanna make sure that the loans that you came in with are yours, not anybody else's loans, and that the income you've put in has been helpful and manage some of those expectations so that it's really clear if things go, go south, what you can do. The third thing that's really important is investing for your future. 
And that means making sure that you are always maxing out your retirement under your name, because in the event of a divorce, that's going to go with you, not necessarily anyone else. Um, making sure that your disability insurance is up to date and is for your career, not just any physician, but if you are a highly specialized technical surgeon, that you are insured for what your job does and what your job pays. Life insurance, particularly if you have kids, making sure that the remaining spouse can cover the expenses if all of a sudden you are gone and vice versa. Those are the things that you really need because you need to be thinking about the next step of if I'm in a position I don't want to be in, how do I keep moving with as little drama as possible? The easiest way to negotiate for what you want is to know what you want. Also to not underestimate what you're worth. And that means a couple of things. This is not just about money. This is about time. This is about quality of life. So there are some people who say, look, I don't really care how much I get paid. I really want X, Y, Z time to myself. I want the freedom to take off at 10 AM because I have some activity that I want to do, whether it's with kids or a hobby, doesn't matter. Negotiating what you want is directly dependent on knowing what it is you want. Time, money, space, flexibility, help. It doesn't matter. But if you don't know, you cannot negotiate for it. The other thing is don't sell yourself short. You have spent a lot of time and energy getting to this point. And so it's important to know what your worth is. It's also important to know how that fits in with your employer or the people working around you, because if you are worth it to them and you can convince them this works in everyone's best interest, it makes it a lot easier to get all of the things that you want out of life and out of your career. You can find me at the Fertility Center of Las Vegas as a physician for help with reproductive endocrinology and infertility needs. You can find me on my podcast, Fertility Docs Uncensored, at any of the major places where podcasts are found. And you can find me on Instagram at, at DrBedient. If you are a pre-med or medical student looking to become a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist, check out medschoolinsiders.com.